Good morning. This is Todd Colburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Lecture 9 of Arrow 4080. Today we're going to be looking at the finite element analysis of beams under transverse loads. Let's take a look at how it works. So before we get started, let's take a quick review of what we saw last time about uh, beams and deflection of beams. We saw a cantilever beam and we saw that the max deflection is given by this value. Except when we look at this value, the deflection being PL cubed over 3EI, what we're really talking about is just the deflection due to the normal stresses that build, that build up in the beam. The, nor the deflections due to the transverse loads due to bending. Okay, But we also saw and probably for the first time, that we get a shear deformation, just like when we have a short little shear element. And that is given by this equation. And depending on the cross-sectional shape and things, this number can be tweaked slightly. But basically, we normally neglect the second part of the deflection, which adds to the deflection due to shear deformation. Because the longer the beam is, the less significant that is. For a given beam, you're going to get a shear deflection. Anytime you have a transverse load, you're going to get a shear deflection. The longer it is, the more deflection you get is proportional to the length. However, the, that value is relatively small, and the value due to bending tends to be much larger, especially if you have anything other than a stubby beam. The longer that beam gets, the larger that first deflection is, the flexion due to the normal stresses, gets larger and larger and larger much more rapidly because you've got the L cubed term, while the shear deflection is only growing proportionally to that length. Therefore, the normal deflections quickly dominate, and we normally neglect that shear deformation. Now, the same thing is true. Now, if we're going to go and try and do a hand analysis of this, a finite element analysis, then we're going to have the opportunity to either ignore shear deflections or try to account for them. Most of the time, we're going to account for only the normal bending, the deflections due to normal bending, and completely ignore shear. However, in this class, we need to also be able to analyze for the deflections due to shear deformations. Does that make sense? Are you with me? So uh, the key, though, for us will be you're going to basically, if you get a transverse beam, you're going to analyze it ignoring shear deflections unless the problem states that you need to account for them. So if the problem states to account for shear deflections, that means you're going to account for both normal and shear, not to neglect the normal, the bending due to normal stresses. If it says uh, nothing about shear deformations, you will just ignore the shear deformations and only calculate that due to normal stresses. Okay? We saw the same equations for a simply supported beam, and we saw our two equations look kind of like this. And then we later saw when we were looking at the Nastran elements that there are little adjustments you can make for the cross section and other things. Okay? All right. So with that in mind, we're ready to move forward into the topic of the day. And how do we analyze these with hand analysis using the finite element method? Okay, so getting back to our beam element, finite element analysis of beams. The first thing we need to do is understand what a beam is. A beam is basically any member that has transverse loads, right? Now we tend to use that terminology when we're dealing with a longer, more slender element with transverse loads. For example, if we have a super short, stubby element, then a transverse load will have dominantly just shear effects rather than the bending effects. As we get a, a section that becomes longer with respect to its cross-sectional size, then our normal stresses dominate and the beam bending itself due to the normal loads is the dominant factor. So a beam is a longer, more slender element with a transverse load, although this can be applied to any element. Um, but what we're going to do here is we already just saw that when we analyze beams, we're going to get deflections due to the normal stresses, and we're going to get dis, def, uh, deflections due to the shear stresses. We're going to start out by neglecting the shear stresses, and then we'll look at how to put those back in. So beam element, we're talking about a more slender element 
with transverse loads. Okay. We need to also understand our global coordinate system. This is the global coordinate system for a beam element. You'll notice it's basically a right hand rule, which means our forces are positive when they're acting in the positive y direction, and the the uh, shear and the um, the, the shear forces and the moments are positive when they're acting in a positive right hand rule convention, which means if x is to the right and y is up, that means we've got a positive moment like this, which happens to be counterclockwise according to this figure here. So once again, the beam is defined by element one to, uh, excuse me, node one that's called out to node two defines our positive x. And then we're gonna have a sign convention like this with positive being in the positive y, positive forces and positive moments are going to be right hand rule okay so that means our we're going to use a v to represent our deflections our transverse deflections and a phi to represent our rotation at the nodes our m and f is going to represent the moments and forces at the nodes and all of these are in this coordinate system shown here okay so the sign convention then moments and rotations are positive in the counterclockwise direction which basically is following the right hand rule Forces are positive in the positive y direction. Displacements are positive in the positive y direction. Okay? Now, in contrast, beam sign convention that we studied in 3261 was using a positive shear was defined when it's chopping off the beam acting from left to right, which means on the left end of the beam, the shear is upward, a positive shear, and on the right end of the beam, a positive shear is downward. And beam sign convention meant a smiley face moment was defined as positive compression on the upper surface that bends the beam into a smiley face that's what's shown here that's beam sign convention beam sign convention meaning that sign convention is defined for beams that we analyzed in 3261 and somewhere however when we're analyzing beams in finite elements we're not going to get forces in this system we're going to be getting forces in the system shown at left okay all right. However, once we've used that sign convention to determine exactly what forces and moments we have in our beam, if we end up plotting the shear moment diagram, we're going to be plotting those not in the global coordinate system or in the finite element beam sign convention, but in actual beam sign convention, which is shown in this figure here. So figure left is how we're going to get our results out of our hand analysis, our finite element analysis. And up at, at the top, that is the way we're going to be the sign convention we're going to use when we plot those okay with that said we're ready to go and look at the stiffness matrix the local stiffness matrix for the element is given here now if our beams happen to be aligned if the local coordinate system of the beam is coincides with the global coordinate system of the beam then this will be not only the local but also the global stiffness matrix for that element okay it is the local and it happens to also be the global if our beam is aligned with the global coordinate system. Our stiffness relation then, we can relate our deflections to our forces and moments through this basic equation here. So now we've got four terms in that stiffness matrix. The first term is the displacement in at element one, the shear displacement. The uh, Second term is the rotation, and then the next two terms are the, ver the transverse displacement and the rotation at node two. And that gives us the forces, the, the shear forces, and the moments at each end, okay? This will be valid. Now, once again, you'll notice here, this only has axial stiffness terms, which means we've neglected the shear displacement. And this is what we're gonna use unless I tell you we're gonna analyze for shear displacements, okay? All right, so this is our coordinate system then, and uh, this is our coordinate system on the left is the one we're going to be using. The one on the right is how we're going to be plotting those. This is our local stiffness matrix. This is the stiffness matrix at left is the stiffness matrix for bending only. And if we want to account for the shear deflection, which happens as our beams get shorter and stubbier and deeper and deeper, then shear becomes more dominant and becomes non-negligible. Uh, if we want to include that shear flexibility, we can follow an approach by Tomoshenko, which basically says he defines this parameter phi. This is a different phi than the rotation. It's given by this term where we get our KS from this little uh, set of bullets here. Plug that in along with the area and all those other properties of the beam. 
that gives us our fee. We plug the fee into our the stiffness matrix here, and this will give us, when we use this equation, the displacements we get will include both normal stress and shear deformation, both bending and shear deformations of that beam. If we use the stiffness matrix at left, we're only going to be getting the bending deformation and, be, and we will be ignoring the shear deformation, okay? So in our class, once again, we're going to never account for shear, only use the bending stiffness unless I tell you to account for shear deformation. Then we're not only accounting for shear deformation, we're accounting for both and we'll be using the stiffness matrix here. So we're going to use the stiffness matrix at left, at left for all of our work unless the problem states to account for the, the shear stiffness or flexibility and in that case we will use the matrix at right. Now once we've done that everything else will be the same. We're going to start by discretizing our beam. In this particular case if we have intermediate forces and moments we're going to need a node there in order to account for those, to apply those. In fact we're going to need a node anywhere we want the deflection, right? Because if we didn't have a node in the middle, if we didn't have these forces in the middle, we would not be getting the deflection at the middle. We're going to construct our global stiffness matrix in the same way we always have, and then we're going to go ahead and impose our boundary conditions to get our displacements. Let's take a look at how that works in a step-by-step -step procedure. So here is our step-by-step <coughs> -step procedure for doing this work. We're going to model our system with nodes and elements just like we always have. We're going to determine our local stiffness matrix for each and every element. We're going to use the bending stiffness only stiffness matrix unless we're told to include those shear effects. Uh, now later we may need to transform this. Remember, right now we're looking at two-dimensional analysis because the beam has uh, deflections that are perpendicular to the, to the axis of the beam. However, right now all of the elements we're ready to cover are all aligned with the global stiffness matrix. If we want to account for them being skew or not aligned, we're going to get that approach. We're going to need that transformation matrix. We'll deal with that in a later lecture. Since our local coordinate system aligns with our global coordinate system, what that means is we're going to uh, our, our global stiffness matrix, element stiffness matrix, will be the same as our local element stiffness matrix simply because the element is aligned with a global system. We're going to assemble our global stiffness matrix in the same way we always have. And then we're going to impose our boundary conditions to reduce that stiffness matrix. Once we've done that, we're going to use our applied external forces to calculate our deflections on that reduced matrix. We then can multiply the global deflections that we get times our global stiffness matrix to get all the rest of the external forces like the reactions. We then can go, that will give us our... Uh, we then can use our global displacements in each and every re relation for the local element to get the forces and moments in the local element. Now, since in this equation, these are our global displacements, this is going to be giving us element forces in global coordinates following the coordinate system we saw already. And since this element happens to be aligned with the global coordinate system, those are also the local forces and moments. However, they follow that sign convention we already saw in the upper, in the leftmost box earlier on. Okay? We already said this. Let's look at an example now. Okay? Let's say we have a beam like this one. We've got two fixed supports and one pin support and two external loads. Okay? I like to echo the input information like where all my grids are and what elements we have. You can ignore this C, X, C, Y, and C, Z. That is setting up for later when we are going to orient our beam using our transformation. We're not ready to do that, so we don't even have that step. Okay. We now can go and write our local stiffness matrix for each and every element using this equation. And that gives us these values. Once again, now if we look at this, we see our first matrix is for the first element. That's connecting joints 1 and 2. That means what we're going to see in this equation is we're going to see this is going to be at node 1. This is at node 1. This is the vertical displacement. And this is the rotation at node 1. This is for element 1, right? And then we've got the transverse displacement and rotation at node 2. 
That means over here, this is V1, V1, V2, V2. That's what that means, right? For element 2, that's going to be going V2, V2 to V3, 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 V4, 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 V5, V5. Then we're ready to construct our global stiffness matrix. We do that in the same manner as we have before. Now we're ready to construct our global stiffness matrix. We do that in the same manner as before. Remember, if we just define our nodes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that means this is going to be V1, V1, V2, V2, V3, V3, V4, V4, V5, V5, V1, V1, V2, V2, V3, V3, V4, V4, V5, V5. Okay? That means our first matrix here is going to go, it's going from 1 to 2. That means it's right here. This is K1. Our second matrix is going from 2 to 4. Our third matrix is going from 3. Let's see. So we're going to go 1, 2, 3. So we're going from 3, 1, 2, 3, 2. And the last one is going to be going from like this. See that? That's where those are going to go, just like we've done it before. Okay. Let's go ahead and erase the ink on this slide. And now we can see when we impose our boundary conditions, we see at node 1, both our V is constrained and our phi is constrained. At node 3, only our V is constrained, our displacement. At node 5, both our deflection and rotation are constrained. This gives us the reduced matrix. And you'll notice that means at node 2 and node 4, we have the vertical displacement and the phi, or the external applied force and moment. There's no moment at either place. We have an external force at both places. So we construct our, local, our global system on the reduced system, and we solve it. And that gives us the displacements that we see here. These are our global displacements. We can then take those global displacements, multiply them by our global stiffness matrix, and that gives us our external forces. You'll notice that the two input forces are here in this matrix, and they're spit out properly at node 2. We had a vertical force, and at node 4, we had a vertical force, right? And all the rest of these values are the constraints forces. So we see at node 1, at node 1, we have a force and a moment. And you'll see that I'm printing out the moment both in inch pounds and foot pounds. Inch pounds is all we really care about. The foot pounds, I think I did that to match our text since the text is showing in that coordinate system. It can be a little confusing. At node 2, we have uh, we had that applied force. We have no applied moment. At node 3, we get the reaction out. At node 4, we had our applied stuff. And at node 5, we're getting our reactions out there again. Okay? So these are our reactions. So we can check that that way. Now we can take those forces. Uh, or excuse me. We're going to go back to our global displacements and we're going to take the corresponding ones for each and every element. So that means for element 1, we're going to get the global displacements at, an element, at node 1 and node 2, plug it in here to calculate our forces. We do that for each and every element, and we end up getting our nodal forces and moments in the sign convention that we saw on that prior slide. Okay, Let's see how that works out. We're going to start 
This is just echoing our inputs, our external forces and our element forces. And now we're going to draw an exploded free body diagram. Well, how do you do that? Well, let's take a look at it together, okay? So we're going to start out by plotting. So we see we we take a look at our model shown here. And what we're going to do is plot out each of our nodes. And we're going to give ourselves room. So we're going to say, okay, node 1, node 2, node 3, node 4, node 5. Basically spreading those out across our page, giving as much space between them and around them as we can. We then are going to go in here and we're going to put in each of our numbers. We're going to start with our external forces. So we say, okay, at node 1, we have a 5,000 pound force. That's in the positive direction. Bang. We also have a 300,000 inch pound moment. Counterclockwise was positive. Bang. 300 inch kips, right? 5K. Okay. Now we're going to go to the next force. Forget the foot pound values. We're not going to be plotting those. We can get rid of all of those so we don't get confused. That's just a repeat of the other inch pound value. Now at node two, we have our applied force. That's a negative, uh, what is that? 10 kips. Okay. And we see, so we've got that one. And at node four, we've got a negative 10 kips. So we draw that right through those elements. Okay. Except we'd say actually kips. We wouldn't, and it would actually be 10.00, right? We'd be showing proper sig figs. All right. So we've covered those. Now we go to our other end at node five. We've got a 5,000 pounds positive force, five kips. And we have a minus 30. So that means it's clockwise, the opposite of the counterclockwise, which is a 300 inch kips, right? All right. So now that's all of our forces have been accounted for. Now we're ready to go to our moments. So what we're going to do is draw our moment, our little elements, as small as we can, so you can see that it's an element, but so that you have as much room as possible to draw your forces. One, two, three, four. And now we're going to plot. We're going to start off with this five kip, and uh, we're going to start off with our five kip force. Remember, up is positive. So at node one of element one, that's five k positive at the moment there is positive which following right hand rule is like this now at the other end we've got a negative five we're talking global coordinates that means it's down and we've got a positive 300 that means counterclockwise and now at the next element element two in the at node one now notice we're not going to put the other parts of those yet we're going to go ahead and just put all these element forces and then we'll clean this up so going to element two now, we've finished this guy. We're going to go and put our negative five on the first node against the element. And against the element, we've got a negative 300. And then on the next node, at node three, we've got a plus five. And we've got a, uh, at, at that node, we've got a minus 300. Okay. Now at the other node, minus three. Then at the other node, we got a plus five, which is here, and a negative three hundred, which is here. Okay, we did that. Then we've got element three. We've got a plus five, and we've got a plus three hundred. And on the other end, we've got a minus five and a plus three hundred. And then on the next one, we've got a minus 5 and a minus 300 and a plus 5 and a minus 300. Okay. Now we've put all of these in and we put all of these in. Now we're ready to clean it up. Now, at our first element, we plotted these from these values. And now on those, while they're acting in the way we just drew on the element, they're going to be equal and opposite on the node. So we're going to reverse the two directions. And on the second node here, we're going to reverse the equal and opposite. That means this is doing this, right? Opposite of those two. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's go back here. At node uh, two of element one, that was a minus five. 
at node two, element one minus five, that's down, that means this is up, right? Up, okay. And then here on the, this one is gonna be opposite, and this means that's gonna be opposite. This is gonna be opposite and opposite. This is gonna be opposite and opposite. This is gonna be opposite. Let's see, three at node two. Three at node two was positive, which means the moment was going this way. So this moment's going this way, right? And uh, at three at two is gonna be minus five. That means it's positive five, okay. And then we come here, this is gonna be opposite, which means this way, and the opposite, which means this way and the opposite and the opposite. Let's see, element four, second node is positive. That means this is negative. Okay, now we can go and look and see if we sum up everything in each node, that ought to sum up the zero. We'll see these two balance at node one and our forces balance at node two We've got plus five, plus five against a 10. That makes sense, and the two moments balance. At node three, we've got a 10 countered by those two fives. We got the two moments that balance, okay? At node four, we've got the two upward fives countering that 10 down and those two moments balance. At node five, we have the 5K down against the 5K reaction and the two moments balance. This is an exploded free body diagram. You'd show that with units and appropriate uh, sig figs. Okay, we then are ready to go to the next slide. Let's erase everything on this, on this slide. We repeat our system here, and now we can plot our element. So we look here and we say, okay, positive sign convention. We looked at our first beam element. It looks like it's up on the left. We see at our first beam element, it's up on the left and is down on the right. That's positive shear, so it's 5,000. So it's going up. You can also look at it just jamming this up. That makes sense. That's the shear we see here. And then we see if we look at our next element here, we see it's down on the left, up on the right. That's negative. So that means the value 5,000 is down here. And that makes sense because this 10,000 pound force here took this from positive five to negative five. Okay, we look at our next little element here and we see it's up on the left, down on the right. That's a positive shear again. That makes sense because this 10 takes us from minus five to plus 5,000 pounds, right? And then here we look at this little element. We see we're down on the left and up on the right. That means it's negative five, and that makes sense because this 10 drove us from plus five to minus five. And that's our shear diagram. And this is in, remember this was in our finite element beam sign convention, and this is our beam sign convention, right? So at the left end, that would be a negative moment according to beam sign conventions. We're gonna start off at negative three. We see if we look at the right end, we see we now have a positive 300K. That means at node two, we're a positive. So we switched over. You can check that by taking 5,000 times, this is 10 feet. So 10 feet is actually uh, one, two, oh, inches, right? So if you multiply by that 5,000 by 120, that's gonna give you a moment going this way, and that counters the 300,000 going that way, and we end up finding that we have totally switched over. Now, if we look at the next node, if look at the right end of the element here, at the next node, at node three now, we see we've got upwards, and uh, uh, we already did well this year. This is downward, that's negative 300,000. If we look at our next element, the other end of node three, we see we've now got, uh, this is a positive, actually both these were positive, we corrected that on the last one, which is here, and we see at this end, 
if we look at the beam, we see that's a negative bending like this, so that's a negative 300,000 there. And now we have, we got, label these 300 inch kips. We label each of these points in the same way. And that's how we turn that into a shear and moment diagram. Make sense? All right. Here's another example. Let's say we have two beam elements and one spring element. We're going to do this the same way. This is now a two-dimensional problem, right? So we've got our nodes and we've got our beams. And when we construct our coordinate system, we're going to, or our global stiffness matrix, we're going to end up something like this because we're going to eliminate our vertical and our moments at node one. We're going to eliminate the vertical at node two. And node three will be free. Node four is completely fixed. So we will go ahead. This is our local stiffness matrix for our beam. We've got two beam elements. And then we have a local stiffness matrix for our spring, which we then will have to transform to get in the local, into the proper coordinate system, right? That guy. So now we see uh, right, that's how we get that, right? There's our transformation. We take our local stiffness matrix and we apply our transformation to get those values, okay? You'll notice that we're getting rid of the rotations. It only has that uh, extensional, which happens to be in the y direction. Now we can construct our global stiffness matrix in the same manner as normal. And we can go and say, okay, at, L, at node one, we have no vertical displacement and we have no rotation due to the wall. At node two, we also have no vertical displacement. At node three, it's completely fixed. I mean, completely free. And at node four, it's completely fixed. So we're going to exclude that from our matrix. Now we're ready to solve our reduced system. All we have is one external force, 50 kilonewtons at node three. So we can go and solve our reduced system equations to get our displacements, use our displacements to get our external forces use our external forces to get our forces in the beam and use those to get our local forces. So now we're going to draw our exploded free body diagram and we start by organizing all of our external forces and our internal forces and then we draw it like this. Let's do this together to make sure we're on top of this. Okay, so we're going to start by writing, uh, drawing each of our nodes, our grid points, and we're going to spread them out as far as we can, one, two, and three, so that we have room to put the forces and moments on them. Then we're going to look at our external nodal forces, and we're going to place them on our diagram. So the first one is at node one in the negative y direction. There's the magnitude. The, and we have a moment there also in the negative. Remember positive was counterclockwise. So this is going to be going like this. That's a reaction also with the magnitude shown here. And then at node 2 we see that we have a positive uh, force. So we'll, I'm going to draw it above. Usually I like to put those below. That's at 116.279 kilonewtons. And then at node 3, we have our applied force of 50 kilonewtons. And at node 4, we have, oops, we didn't draw 4. There's 4. We have our 3488 newton force. Then we're going to draw each of our elements nice and small so we have room for our forces. This third one is a spring, not a beam. And we're going to draw those forces on. So we start with node one, element one. We've got a negative force there, a shear, and we have a negative moment. The magnitudes are shown. On the second joint, 
we have a positive and a negative. The magnitudes are already shown. Now on element two, we have uh, node one, we have a positive, the magnitude is shown, and on the end we also have a positive moment as shown. At node two of element two, we have a negative, and magnitude is shown, and we have a zero moment. We then go to element three. Now normally, for spring elements, if we have our uh, if we have transformed into the local coordinate system, then it would be from node 1, which in this case is 3, to node 4, which in this case is here. Uh, excuse me, to node 2, which is there. Now for the spring element, normally positive would be like this. But uh, for in this case, actually, we have this still in global coordinates. My little program where I generated this. I did not convert it because our other elements weren't converted. What that means is that these are still in global coordinates. So this first force is actually in global coordinates, so it's acting downward. And the second force, also in global, that's acting upward. Now that we've placed all of our forces, we then go and put the corresponding. So at node 1, element 1, we put opposite of the force and opposite of the moment. At the second node we put opposite of the force and opposite of the moment. At the second node, the first, which is the first node of element two, we're going to go the opposite of the force, opposite of the moment. And at node three from element two, opposite of the force, there's zero moment. We put the magnitude 46.5 and then at element three, opposite, what's that, uh, 3.49, and on node four, 3.49 kilonewtons. Kilonewtons, you'll notice all these are, that's actually kilonewtons, 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 kilonewton meter for all these units through here. Okay, let's see. I think we got everything here. So once again, these elements here. Now this, if this, this is the global, this is the element global forces. And so they're in global coordinates. If we had multiplied by our T2 star matrix, our transformation matrix, like we'll do later, then we would have put these back into local. And then these would have been reported differently and we would have written them differently. Now that we have all the forces drawn, we're ready to draw our shear and moment diagram. To do that, we're going to focus on our elements. If we focus first on element 1 here, we see that the shear is just like positive. It, uh, it's the opposite of positive, right? Because it's supposed to be chopping off, moving from left to right, and it's actually pushing up. So this is negative, whatever that shear value is, which is 69.8 kilonewtons. All the units down here are wrong too because my program wasn't updated. Okay, and if we look at element two, we see that is a typical positive shear. So this jumps from here to here. And you'll notice the difference between these two, this is what 46.5 kilonewtons as well. Uh, so the difference between that uh, is this external force. We have 60, negative 69.5 plus a positive 116.279, that better provide that 46.5. Now if we look at the moments, look at the left end of element 1, we have a uh, positive moment, that's the 69.8 as shown, and then at node 2, we see that we have the, we can use the right end of node 1 to show that, that's a negative 139.5, and it's a linear change to get there. We see the right end of node 2 is 0, and so we're going linearly to that value. That becomes our moment diagram where we'd write the value here and the value right down here of 139.5 kilonewton meters. This is 0 right here. Okay, there's our shear diagram, there's our moment diagram. That's how we do those. Okay, let's look at another example. Here's one, two beams, a couple forces, and 
uh, some constraints. There's our deal, here's our other deal, and now we can go and start working it. We'll write out our stiffness matrices. We've got two local stiffness matrices and one global. We do the, this is repeating the global. We now apply our boundary conditions. These are some of the easiest boundary conditions to apply. And now we have a reduced system. We solve the reduced system for the four uh, displacements. We use the displacements to get the forces. We use the forces to get the element stresses. And then we can sketch our free body diagrams. That's a repeat of what we just had. And now we can plot it out. Let's try that together. So if we look here, we first start by saying, okay, we have three nodes. We have one, two, three, okay? At node one, we have a 10 Newton force, 10 kilonewtons, bang. At node one, we have a 12.5 kilonewton moment in the positive, right? At node two, we have a 10 kilonewtons down. So at node 2, 10 kilonewtons. And the moment there is 20. We had a moment as well. So we have this external moment. It's positive. We'll draw it down here. 20 kilonewton meters. And then we have at node, uh, that's this. And then we have at node 3, we have no vertical and we have minus 25 minus 25 drawn like this okay all right yeah that's correct all right then we go to our elements we draw our little elements in here one and two all right and at the first node of one it's positive bang at the same place we have a positive bang at node two it's negative pow and the moment is positive bing and then we have at node, the first node of element two, we have zero, and we have a moment two five, which is positive. At the other end, we have a minus two five, okay? Then we can go and adjust. So we're gonna say at element one, we're gonna flip that force and flip this moment. At element two on the first element, we're gonna flip that force and flip that moment. And now we're going to go to element two, and we're going to only have the moment to flip. And at node three, we only have the moment to flip. So if we look at that, we see at node one, 10 kilonewtons against a 10 kilonewton internal shear. That balances. And our 12, 5 kilonewton external matches our 12, 5 kilonewton internal moment. That matches. At node two, we say 10 kips down perfectly balances our uh, 10 kilonewton force coming from the left end. The right end had no shear at all, curiously. And we see that our moments balance. We've got a positive 20 kilonewton external, which is uh, resisted by both the 12.5 coming from element 1 and the 2.5 coming from element 2. Excuse me, no, coming from element 1 was 17.5 plus 2.5 which balances. At node 3 we see we just have the moments balancing. So we have a balanced system. And now that we have the balanced system we can plot our shear and moment diagrams. We see that first we have what looks like a positive shear on element 1. So we have 10 kilonewtons positive shear. And then because we had no shear in our next element it goes to 0. If we look at our moments we plot this guy. That looks like that's negative, so we plot that down here below the axis. When we get to our next point, we see looking at the right end of element 1, which means right here we've got 17.5 at that end, kilonewton meters, right? It's going to be a linear change going between. But we also had an external moment of 20 inch kips, or kilonewton meters, so we now take that 17.5 and subtract 20, that brings us right down to here. Then you'll see, since there's no shear in this beam, the summation of the area under the shear diagram is zero. So there's no change, no change, until we get this end when we hit this moment it's taken out. So this happens to be, we label that value, that is our moment diagram. So we got an exploded free body diagram. 
and that helps us develop our moment diagram, okay? Let's look at our next example. So this is our next example, and here what we have is a beam. Looks like a pretty simple beam, but this time we're going to account for not only bending, but also shear flexibility, okay? So we're going to start off in the normal manner by kind of echoing some information, fine. And then we're going to go and construct our stiffness matrices, our local stiffness matrix for each. Now, this is actually the local stiffness matrix for a beam, only the bending stiffness. We're actually going to not use this. We're going to use the stiffness matrix for a when we have shear, which means that we have that little phi term. We're going to calculate that little phi term, and then we're going to calculate the slightly, lower, uh, slightly more complicated matrix. Once we've done that, we then calculate, we get our, our local stiffness matrices for element one and element two, and then we assemble our global stiffness matrix. Are you with me? We can now impose our boundary conditions. Remember, we're pinned at both ends. That means that gets rid of the vertical displacement at both ends. And then we can solve our reduced system for our displacements. That includes shear flexibility. We then plug those in to get our external forces. We then plug those in to uh, use the corresponding displacements to get our element forces. If we had actually analyzed with no shear flexibility, we would have got these kind of values. Notice the difference here between these values. You'll see with shear flexibility, our vertical displacement here is this, and that corresponds with this. So you'll see, let's see, 0.259 versus point, uh, let's see, 0 0.00259 versus 0 0.00247. So we get uh, a little different, uh, a little different deflection when shear flexibility is accounted for. And at this end, we're getting, an, at the node 3, we're getting a little, uh, looks like identical values. Node 3 looks like it's the same. Node 2 is different. So that is all we have. Uh, make sure you practice those homework problems. Make sure you can do that for both sure when we account for shear flexibility and when we don't. Okay. Also, you need to be able to develop those shear, these exploded free body diagrams, and to translate that into shear moment diagrams. Okay. Enjoy.